job, Miss Patty. That was a blessing. Miss Patty's really jumped in and uh, worked so hard to try to cover some gaps recently and teaching kids class and singing and being a part of uh, the orchestra. She, she does a lot around here, and I appreciate that so much. <clears throat> um, let's take our Bibles tonight over to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to look at how God and His grace worked through some people's lives. And that's going to be a series for Sunday nights uh, for a while. And uh, we're just going to kind of, you know, navigate through the scriptures and look at the grace of God. Um, just, just how the Lord gives us His love and His peace and His care and His patience, uh, those resources of God through you to carry us through some unforeseen and some tough times. And we need the scriptures to show us that once in a while, amen? amen. And uh, <clears throat> hey, I want you to pray about um, tomorrow, uh, our, the power in the building is going to be turned off, and uh, there's 400 amps coming uh, from the street to this building, and uh, it can be very dangerous, and we've uh, hired a professional licensed uh, electrician company to come. He'll bring a couple of his guys, and they're going to take this and dismantle this um, main panel right here, and they're going to put it back into where we're building our new sound booth and uh, just trying to work under the concrete and then uh, dismantle some of uh, these lines above me here and get rid of, get rid of this sub panel over here, uh, which is completely overloaded. And uh, once we got into this building, we started to realize that uh, some people came in that thought they knew what they were doing and really uh, quite a bit of work is uh, what was not done right. And so uh, we want to make sure that it's fire code safe, uh, that it's legal, and that it's functioning and uh, things like that. So uh, just by faith, every single day uh, we are making decisions around here uh, to take this out, restructure that, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is a step of faith, believe me. And so tomorrow we're going to lose power uh, probably up until maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, but we're still planning on having Bible study here Wednesday night. Uh, Brother Ryan, let's just make sure that we've got our, our, uh, our battery-operated lighting uh, stuff that we have for some of our jobs and things. So we will have church here Wednesday night, and I uh, look forward to that. But I can't guarantee you that we have power, uh, but uh, I'll let you know if, if any of that changes. But uh, pray for safety. Pray for uh, we're going to be cutting some concrete where a couple of these cones are at. We're going to be cutting that out hopefully tomorrow and the next day and uh, getting some of the floor uh, patched in and taken care of, stuff like that. So this is a big week. We have uh, HVAC, the air conditioning starting. Uh, we've, uh, we, we dismantled the gas line last week, and we're going to be going into the roof and putting gas lines up on the roof. And then hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have another AC unit uh, with a crane and all that added on top uh, over uh, to this side of the building. And so uh, just, uh, just keep praying, keep coming, and uh, keep believing that God can and God will. Amen. Uh, but uh, let's, we're also in a season where we need to, to, to keep pace with the giving, too, and make sure that we have things paid and uh, done. Isn't it looking nice outside? The property's looking good, amen? And uh, that's just, uh, we're saving a lot of money. For example, I'll give you an illustration of how we saved money on just one line item. So when we bought these buildings and we were able to move in about uh, four and a half months ago, I guess, we moved in and moved out of our rented space, uh, it would cost somewhere between about $85,000 and $100,000 to paint both buildings. That's, that's what a, uh, a, a licensed painting contracting company would charge us on a commercial level, especially because it's block. It was raw block, and uh, that takes multiple coats, minimum two, up to four coats, uh, and uh, we were able to paint both of these buildings custom to way that we wanted them for 17000 So for us to be able to save on one line item, what is that? Uh, somewhere around eighty grand. Uh, we saved on one line item. We could put that money uh, you know, somewhere else. And so 
uh, we're, we're trying to stretch and be stretched and be wise and letting God do uh, what God is going to do. Uh, as uh, some of the announcements were being done earlier tonight, I was looking at the footprint on the floor of where all the walls used to be. Look at all of that. And uh, electrical and all of the work that it took to do that. And uh, God's turning this into a church. And I thank the Lord for that. And so it'll be classy and first, uh, uh, you know, it'll, it'll just be done very, very well and state of the art. Uh, but uh, we still, still need quite a few time, uh, months to be able to do that. So pray for us this week. It's a big week. And we'll see what the Lord will do with that. First Samuel chapter 1. Let's take a moment. Let's so all stand together. Uh, First Samuel chapter 1. I'm glad everybody or most of everybody seems to be feeling better. Uh, and so praise the Lord for that. And so uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're just kind of waving and saying hi and things like that. We, we, we want uh, the weather changes to be favorable for our church. Hey, we have Easter coming up Sunday, so don't miss Easter, okay? And we've got a lot planned, a lot of things that we're doing and happening, and uh, I thank the Lord for that. Before I forget, uh, Miss Jenny, your stuff is up there from uh, soup day, and uh, so I set it to the side. Uh, thanks for driving from Idaho this morning to be at church tonight, and uh, so, uh, no, that's great. Frost's got a lot going on, but I thank the Lord for them, and uh, I want you also to pray for the deeps. They're in Germany. And I've uh, been kind of uh, talking with them via text and some email, and I want you to pray for them. Keep praying for them and uh, active duty military family in our church. And they can't really see beyond the camera, but there's a lot going on in this room, and they, uh, they said they were, wish they were a part of it, but they are a part of it uh, just from a distance, and I thank the Lord for their faithfulness. So let's pray for them. Let's pray also for the vicars, and uh, the vicars are in Louisiana and uh, also active duty Navy, and uh, so uh, a part of our church, members of our church, both families just from a distance, and uh, let's pray for some of these that uh, the Lord would circle them back through where they can actually sit in the room like us, amen, and uh, that'd be a blessing, uh, and so uh, let's keep praying uh, for the Beatties as well. They're out in Texas, a part of our church as well, a police officer, and uh, they pray for, uh, for our church, and they're, they're all in just like we are. And uh, I, I don't want to forget these families uh, that love us, and they're not at every service, uh, but when they can be here, uh, I want to be able to make sure that we're continuing to pray for them and love on them, and uh, that's a blessing. Okay, First Samuel chapter 1. Look at verse number 11. So we're going to talk about uh, Hannah, and it takes grace to surrender. It takes help from God to let loose of some things that you like and are important to you, all right? And so let's look at that. Verse number 11, and she vowed a vow. I'm talking about Hannah. Why? Because she was bitter. The Bible says that she had bitterness, not bitter like angry, but she had bitterness of soul, the Bible says, in verse number uh, 10, and she was in bitterness of soul. Why? Because she tried to have a kid and couldn't have a child. Um, you know, some of the people that can't have kids sometimes look over at families that have three, four, five, six kids and complain about them or don't treat them right or, you know, feel like they're in the way. I was reading an article last week and it was uh, about Hollywood and different things that were happening, some of the actors and actresses and all of that. Of course, uh, that's not something that I I uh, uh, look at or like, it's just some things that I learn about uh, at the day and age in which we live in. And one of these actresses said this, in quote, she said, when I had my first child, it ruined my life. She said, not only did it ruin my life, it ruined my career. Well-known actress. I thought, how stupid. Because we live in a day and age where, you know, yuppies the goal and there's nothing wrong with having nice things, uh, but you ought to have those, not let those things have us, right? And so people are the most important thing in our earthly life, and obviously, spiritually, God ought to be the most important. But let's look at how God was teaching her. Look verse number 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me. 
and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. It's interesting to note that there's probably no such surrendering grace that God has given to somebody like he gave to Hannah. Hannah couldn't have a child. She goes up to the temple. She prays. Uh, even so, now Samuel comes and says, Ah, you're drunk. Well, she says, I haven't drinking anything. I'm, I am uh, just so sorrowful in my heart because I can't have a child. But if God would give me a man child, she wanted a little boy. She made a vow to God, I'll give him back to God. Now, how many of you are a little bit like me? Sometimes we make promises, we don't really keep them, right? But she kept it. She kept it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for church tonight. I pray that you continue to build our life, that you would build our church, physically build our church, but also, Lord, numerically build our church. Thank you for that visiting family that came today and just uh, watching how you're building the church just one person at a time. I pray that you'd build us financially, build our faith, uh, build us with your grace. Lord, you just keep building us spiritually. We thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can have a seat. Can you imagine going to God and saying, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll give it all back to you? Uh, you know, God at times in the Bible shows us that people made a vow with God and they kept their vow and, and God blessed them for that. The Bible tells us here that Hannah went to God and said, God, if you give me a child, uh, I, I will give you him back. In Hannah's life, we catch a small por a portrait of a woman who, by faith, went to God and trusted God and sought God and, and brought her cares and her problems and her issues and what sh she cared about uh, to God, which is an important thing for us to do. And God responded to that. Look what it says in verse number 12. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli, rather, sorry, Eli marked her mouth. Uh, Samuel obviously was the child, but um, uh, Eli marked her mouth and was watching her. And he thought, oh, okay, here's another Looney Tune coming to church tonight, right? And uh, she's, she's a wacko, and, you know, she's just filled with the devil and drunk and stuff like that. Now, Hannah, the Bible says, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. You know, it's important that we don't get critical in church. You don't know what's in somebody's heart. You don't know what somebody's dealing with. We shouldn't look across the room and say, oh, wow, they have a lot of money. You don't know that. You shouldn't look across the room and say, oh, look, at they're a bunch of Looney Tunes. And they might be. You might be. Sometimes the Looney Tune calls out the Looney Tune, okay? Brother Nix called me out many times. And so, you know, listen, once in a while, we, uh, we, we, we just need to make sure that we got a sensitive spirit. Hey, well, let me not get my nose in something uh, Lord, uh, give grace to that person who's praying right there, Amen. right? Amen. Look at verse number 15, and Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Notice how God is blessing uh, the pouring out of her heart as unto the Lord. And so she says, listen, I'm I, I, I desire to have a child. I came to the temple. I've been coming to the temple, and I'm asking God that he would bless me in this way. Look at verse number 19. And they arose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to uh, Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, husband and wife, went to worship, come back to their house. God blessed that relationship of husband and wife and gave a child. And the Lord remembered her. Listen, God remembers when we go to him in prayer. God remembers when we repent of our sin. David said, I'll be sorry for my sin. It's kind of a thing going around right now that uh, 
you have to be sinless in order to get saved and kind of have this don't sin anymore. Well, I'm going to shock everybody right now. I believe I got saved on August 21st, 1993 in Carlsbad, California, wearing my wetsuit, sitting by the fire, about ready to have a hot dog. I got saved and asked Jesus to come into my heart. For the best of my 15-year-old ability, having grown up in church and, uh, you know, my parents helped me have a testimony, but I wasn't sure about all that. I just, just didn't, you know, connect the dots with some of this stuff. wasn't ready to, to, to ask Jesus personally into my heart. But I got saved in 1993, 15 years old. I got baptized August 29th, 1993. I'm not going to shock some of you. Some of you, you already know this about me. I've sinned already today. Which by the looks of all of you, you have too. Okay. And uh, I, don't, I, I, I struggle with people who think they don't sin. Sin is a post-salvation guarantee. Brother Nick, come on, man. Help me. They don't need you that bad. And, uh, you know, it, so, so sin does not go away after my soul has been redeemed. I still have the pagan flesh that wants to do everything but do anything with or for God. Right? So I battle the flesh. Paul speaks so much of the battle of the flesh. The things, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it to memory, but the things I want to do, I can't seem to do it. Right. And all the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing those. He says, I got this battle in my flesh. Do you know why God put that in his heart, to be honest? Because it connects with all mankind. Right. That God worked with and used Paul in a great way, and God can work with and use us too. And the flesh is a battle the rest of our life. I don't believe for one second that we have to be sinless in order to be saved. Right. I think that's a lie. I think it's self-righteous. I think it's a deceit to snub our nose down at others. Oh, you still sin? Oh, okay, you're not saved yet. Who are we? Yeah. That is a very, very wrong... And here's what we're doing. We're not reaching people for Christ. We're pushing them away. And so don't, 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 don't fall for the trap that you have to be redeemed, uh, self-redeemed, before you come to Jesus. Okay, because the Bible says that we cannot even as flesh call on the name of Jesus unless the Father gives that to us. So now all of a sudden, if I clean myself up, so to speak, and come to Jesus, now I'm saved because I put my sin away. You don't have the power to put your sin away. Right. You don't. Matter of fact, the Bible uh, tells us in Proverbs, even the thought of foolishness is sin. We have thoughts of foolishness every day. Every day. Pride, um, you know, uh, we, we can even have pride and humility. Right? Is that why Jesus told the Pharisees, come on, man, you're fasting to distort your face and you put all of your, your, your you know, robes and garb on and you stand in the main street so that people could see and recognize how holy thou art. God says, you've not only not been blessed, you know not the Lord. Yeah. You're doing it for yourself. Right, right. So we cannot eat for three days and have pride. Because we're hoping somebody asks us out to lunch. Oh, no, no, I'm fasting. I called a missionary one time. And I said, uh, hey, how you doing? This was out of the country. And uh, I said, hey, how you doing? I was thinking about you. Want to say hi? I'm fasting today. And he kind of had this um, slow, um, um, you know, kind of um, methodical speech for the 30 seconds we spoke. My wife and I are, are fasting today. I said, okay. I said, I, man, I'm sorry. I said, uh, why don't I call you? I don't know how a phone call interrupted that, yeah. but uh, he wanted to make sure I knew about it. We were probably 5,000 miles away from each other. 
I ended up seeing him in person a few months later in another country. I was on a, I was on a, a mission trip in another country. And uh, he began to tell me about fasting. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, you remember when I called you and you were fasting? He says, oh, he says, yeah, that's right. He says, I forgot to tell you, I fast every day. And I go, how do you fast every day? And he said, well, he says, my wife and I found this healthy uh, lose weight in your 40s uh, uh, chart. And it was talking, he didn't talk about God. He didn't talk about the Bible. He didn't talk about praying. He didn't talk about any of those things. It was fasting from like 1 to 6, 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. every day about, you know, health and cleansing and things like that. Let, let, let me tell you this. It's probably good, good on you for all of that. I probably should do more of it. But let's not connect that with something I was spiritually trying to get blessings from when I was just trying to shed a few pounds. Right. And honestly, by the way, if you're going to answer the phone, don't tell the person you're fasting. Amen. There could be pride in fasting. Come to find out, it wasn't even spiritual. It wasn't any, anything connecting to help me walk with God. It was just over an internet chart. I'm telling you, some things like this can slip out. And I'll just tell you, that's sin. Amen. The, Bible, the, the Bible says that when sin, you know, it just, it, it, it can be clothed in so many different ways. And even while we're in church, we could be sinning. Answering our phone. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, not turning it off, okay? Oh, not turning it off. Well, Brother Mary should be in church right now. Okay, all right, all right. Amen. Well, amen. amen. All right, where were we? <laughs> Look at verse number 20. Wherefore, now I'm going to call Pastor Mary. Why are you calling one of the guys in my church during church Sunday night? No, call me Brother Mary. <laughs> you better stop right now. Wherefore, look at verse number 20, wherefore, and now arguing with the pastor, this is just sin all over the room, isn't it? Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about that uh, after Hannah had conceived that she bare a child and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. God gave her her request. You know, the Bible tells us that the Lord blesses when we come to him and talk to him. But you know what? There's difficulties. Hannah had difficulty. In an era which Hannah lived was during the time of the judges when every man, the Bible says, did that which was right in his own eyes. By the way, there's been sin in the world every moment in every man's heart since Eve took a bite. And, you know, my wife made a good point because I'm always trying to remind her that Eve ruined the marriage, okay? And, uh, and then she says, no, 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 no. And, uh, you know, Adam was standing right there. He knew about it, you know? All of a sudden, she reaches over. And the, and, and the Bible says that, that Eve was deceived. Adam was never deceived. Uh, Eve had to go through a whammy judgment from God because of her sin, but Adam had to go through a double whammy from God because he knew all along. See, sometimes we bust on the women for, ah, you know, it was Eve. No, 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 it was Adam, actually. It was Adam. Adam's fault in the whole thing. Amen. And uh, so the Bible says that she had some difficulty. Judges chapter 21 and verse 25 says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. See, this is not a new thing for God. I mean, have you noticed the average church is not getting necessarily more and more and more full? It's getting less and less and less full. I mean, the Bible says as the day of Noah is, so is the Son of Man will come. And so, you know, it's getting more and more closer to that day. And that's why the Bible says, hey, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together, so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We need to be more in church, more in our Bible, more closer to God, more doing the things that God cares about as we see the day coming. Amen? Amen. And uh, so there was difficulty. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. I want you to look that up, if you will. 
Uh, what made Hannah's situation particularly difficult was that she was in a polygamous relationship. Yeah. Polygamy's wrong. Amen. You know, this, this, this Mormon ideology, which, by the way, they've been changing their rules since the beginning. Yeah. Blonde hair, blue eye, okay, yeah, all right. And then they change it. Baptizing the dead, and then they change it. You know, it's all religion. Yeah. Religion... We'll go to hell if that's all we have is religion. David said, I will be sorry for my sin. You know, part of prayer is confession. Lord, I'm sorry for being stupid. I shouldn't think this way. I shouldn't talk this way. I have never, ever in my life seen somebody who believes that there's no more sin after salvation. Here, here, here's the rub. There's sin after salvation, but God says he'll remember it no more. Amen. So there's no judgment for the sin, for death and hell, after we receive Christ as our personal Savior. Amen. But you still have to deal with you. Amen. And if you think there's no more dealing with you now that you're saved, you have a problem. You know not the things of God. And the Bible, that's why we got to get in it and study it. And the Bible tells us that um, God, through the Holy Spirit, works the rest of our life. After we get saved, from the moment of salvation, we got, the Holy Spirit works the rest of our life dealing with sin and righteousness. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The down payment of the promise of salvation to see him again someday. The Bible says that it is the Holy Spirit working in us the things of righteousness. So that I don't do the things that I would and, and, and desire, right, to, to crucify the flesh. We have no power to crucify the flesh without the grace of the Holy Spirit working in our life. Amen. And without the surrender which is the provoking of the Holy Spirit. We have no power to surrender outside of the Holy Spirit. All right, let me give you another one that's a rub. <clears throat> Baptism cannot be performed until you're saved. Amen. And I'll tell you why. Because baptism, the Bible explains in the book of Romans, baptism is the first decision Yes, we say the first step of obedience. Okay, okay. Well, let's go a little bit farther into discipleship because it's Sunday night, so we can dig a little bit further. Amen. Amen. Baptism is the first decision to bury the flesh to be in control so that when we're raised up in the newness of life, it is now the person who has received Christ as a personal Savior. The Holy Spirit leads the flesh to surrender and now give the fight of the flesh to the Holy Spirit and let God bury it and raise us up now led of the Holy Spirit. No flesh can get baptized on their own, which by the way, nobody wants to get baptized. Nobody likes getting baptized. Why do you think there's so many more people saved and not baptized? The flesh hates it. You know the thing about baptism? You will remember it. That's right. Wow. You'll remember it, man. When we get this thing hooked up over here, and Brother Ryan turns on the heat Saturday night from his phone. What? Yeah, come on. Because we got a digital something something over there. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it, it, it's top of the line first class. And by the way, $8,000, God gave that to us. Man, God worked with a family in our church, and it was a miracle gift, not even ever unwrapped. A church bought it, and it was the wrong size. And God gave it to us. Amen. Come on, that's a big deal. Amen. You know what that tells me? God says, all right, I'm going to give you a nice one because we're going to use it a lot. Yeah. Right? And people are going to remember it, and we're going to remember watching it and pray, praising the Lord and singing and all that. But let's not think... I was an assistant pastor years ago, and I, I, I so much didn't like these people, I didn't work there more than two and a half months. 
two and a half months. Now, I thank the Lord for Brother Ryan. He, he doesn't like me, but he's still been here for six years. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so um, I remember that I, I led a teenager to Christ. Br Brother Frost, uh, I led a teenager to Christ, and you led somebody to the Lord yesterday in the park. Amen. Yeah. And uh, got that testimony, and, and what, what, what an exciting thing. A husband and wife go out with their son, pass out gospel tracts, and you talk to the man for an hour. Wow. And here's what I thought. Here's what I thought. Yesterday when I was texting back and forth with you, and you were sharing that testimony with me, not bragging on yourself, but just rejoicing about how somebody got saved. Amen? Amen. I didn't tell you this, but I got to thinking about it, Brother Frost. I thought... For a busy businessman to give an hour of his time to just stand there and talk to somebody that was standing there in the park. Most people don't give five seconds to people. Not in this Southern California culture. And you know what? God sees it. And when you need something, I believe that the word of God, here it says here uh, that we read that God remembered Hannah. Come on, man. God remembers when we go and do something for him. Amen. He remembers when we come to the temple and we praise and sing and give and help and tear something down and pass out a track and stand there for an hour and tell somebody about Jesus. God remembers those things. Amen. And as we get baptized, baptism is the first sign that spiritual can have control over carnal. Amen. And the Holy Spirit does the work. I have never in my life seen a husband that believes in the nonsense that you don't sin anymore after you get saved. That's actually a good husband. I've never really, really seen it. I've never seen a good, strong marriage that believes in all that. Because here's, here's the rub. When you don't feel like you need to say sorry for God, yeah. uh, sorry to God for having a bad attitude, you'll never say sorry to your kids for raising your voice. You'll never go to your wife and humble yourself and apologize, say, I shouldn't have said that to you. No, why? Because back in 1993, I asked the Lord to come into my heart and there's no more sin, so I don't sin anymore. Well, maybe just ask a few people around you if you sin anymore. <laughs> all right, all right, well, good. That went over. Excellent. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 2. Did I ask you to look at that? Uh, verse number 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall clave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Although polygamy was sometimes practiced among the Jews and others, by the way, it was never blessed of God. Amen. It was never God's plan. Yeah, but look at Abraham. Yeah, well, look at him. Yeah, 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 but look at this guy and look at this guy. Yeah, uh-huh, look at it. It's jacked up. Every time a man had more than one wife, there was sin and generational problems. It was, if it was a design of God, he would have made Adam, Eve, and Elma. I mean, it just wasn't God's design. You guys are going to love this one. Oh, yeah. All right. Listen up. A Mormon once wanted to argue with Mark Twain, true story, about polygamy. After a heated discussion, the Mormon asked Twain to give any biblical Bible passage that forbade polygamy, and he will listen. Mark Twain replied, he said, oh, that's simple. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. <laughs> but you know, here's the deal. Because of the polygamous arrangement in Hannah's life, she endured great difficulty at the hands of Elkanah's other wife, Penina. You remember that whole thing, man? Although uh, uh, Elkanah genuinely loved Hannah, Penina despised her and didn't hesitate to show it. There was a lot of We've seen that in Abraham, and we, we've seen that in, 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 in other uh, illustrations where there's competition between these wives. There's a TV show in, in Utah about this dude and all of his wives. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, I, I've asked my wife about this stuff. It's like, okay, 
I'm a dude. I'm not a woman. <laughs> Why are you girls okay with that? He's like, I didn't. I know, but you're part of that whole thing. Why, why would a woman be okay with being number five? I mean, you know, somebody's not reading the Bible, dude. And, and our truth comes from the Word of God. And there's, a, there's so much deception for women and uh, manipulation from a man. And it's all earthly, pagan worship, selfish pride, flesh. And it messes everything up. And you know what you connect that with? Religion. Religion is the problem. First yeah. Samuel chapter one tells us. Look at let, let's look back at it now really quick. First Samuel chapter one. Now there was a certain man of Ramoth Zaphim R of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, and the son of uh, Jeroham, the son of all right, look at verse number two. And he had two wives. Why? Because it's just what the flesh wanted. Let's look at King David. David messed the whole kingdom up. He messed his whole life up. He messed everything up. God still blessed in so many ways, but God has never blessed that. And, uh, you know, we're not allowed to just get rid of each other. I mean, thank, thank the Lord for the Bible, or my wife would have already. Some of these little boundaries and disciplines, I know that the Lord has kept her. Amen. But the Bible tells us that it was a fleshly thing, and this is just what he wanted. And Hannah's difficulty was so great that she was deeply saddened to the point of not eating. She was so sad. She was sad because she was barren. And Hannah was unable to have children. And I think God does certain things when there is a fleshly manipulation. He lets certain things be the way they're going to be. And I'm thankful that Hannah was a woman of God, sought God, and God blessed in a messed up situation. And I believe God can bless in certain decisions and certain situations. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe that God can bless a second marriage. Amen. Might not have been his perfect will. Maybe there was pride on both sides. Maybe there, one side wasn't saved, or maybe they were just weren't walking with God, and things got all messed up. If you're in, if you're in a, a marriage right now, stay in it. God can work it out. But I don't believe that somebody's worthless and you throw them away or they can't be godly or, or tremendously used of God because there was a second marriage in that. I, 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 I don't believe that. I believe God can work with anybody where they're at if they have a Hannah spirit and just come to God humbly and say, God, this is who I am, where I'm at. Would you work with me? I believe God can do that. Now, here's where the self-righteous comes in. No, he can't. No, God, no. There are certain roles that we can't fulfill. There are certain things that maybe, uh, you know, we shouldn't pretend or be a part of. Okay, let's, let, let, let's just make sure that I'm where I'm supposed to be in the will of God. But listen, at the end of the day, none of us deserve to even come into the house of God. Amen. And if you think you do deserve it, well, the problem's right there. We don't deserve nothing. It's a privilege we get to be around God, amen? amen? And it's a privilege we get to be around God's people. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. Sometimes I think they ought to just be in the field of the corn. But nonetheless, they are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb, not loom, is his reward. So, God says heritage there doesn't mean they belong to us. Hannah said, God, if you give me a child, I'm being made fun of from the other wife. I didn't ask for this. And, and many times in the Bible, young ladies came up the ranks. They had to do this, and it wasn't a choice. So it wasn't them being 
a hussy in the alley is they didn't have a choice. It was the culture they were made to. And she went to God and said, God, if you'll help me with this, I'll give them back to you. And she understood that people don't belong to people. People belong to God. Amen. We don't get to do whatever we want with our kids. We don't get to, you know, call the shots on everything. They're in heritage. It's a, it's a Lent to be a manager of a property that has never been yours and never will be. God says, I want you to manage these kids, but they belong to me. And Hannah came back and gave him to the Lord. Sometimes God allows diversities and hopelessness situations so that we can come to him and rely on him and call upon him. Genesis chapter 30, verse number 1, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. You remember the argument between um, um, uh, Angie? We've talked about it a lot. It was the um, um, I'm thinking about it right now. Um, the, the the locks or something. Uh, uh, anyways, it, it, it's 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 escaping me right now. Uh, two wives were arguing over uh, just just one of them working in the field. Uh, the mandrakes, right? The mandrakes locks locks for love. I don't know what I, I'm, I'm telling you. I messed up today, but. Um, so, yeah, my mom, gives, she's, my mom says, here, take this. <laughs> you know, you got to watch out for my mom and brother Nick. And, and say, here, I got something for you. You know, yeah, you get arrested and go to prison. And so, uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's fights and arguments among all these wives against each other. I have more kids than you, you know. And it's this messed up marriage and messed up family. And she's trying to wean through some of this stuff. And the Bible says in verse number two, and Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? You know, Hannah wasn't the only one. There's been a lot of women that haven't been able to have children. And she know, God can work ways and design through his grace to be able to fulfill and give. But I'm going to tell you this. As a woman desires to have a child, that's still not a full fulfillment. Only God can be the fulfillment of somebody's life. Now, it's easy to say, but it's actually true. There's been times where I've had money more than I've ever needed. And there's been times where I've had nothing, sold everything that I had just to get through the month. Either way, what I didn't need was more money or less money or whatever. We needed God every step of the way, whether I recognize it or not. You know, she was belittled. She was barren. She struggled a lot. Philippians chapter 4. I want you to look at it real quick and we're done. Philippians chapter 4. We'll continue again next Sunday night. Philippians chapter 4. You know, worry affects everything. Worry affects our minds, our emotions, our ability to think clearly. It's been said, don't ever make any major decisions when you're tired and when you're worried. Because bad decisions can be made in those times. <clears throat> but it doesn't solve everything. Sitting there and thinking about it and worrying about it doesn't solve anything. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I've stood and looked at that electrical box and I've worried about it a lot. You say, well, that's a dumb thing, Pastor. Yeah, I know it's a dumb thing, but it costs a lot of money to move that thing. And then we're sitting on lots of concrete. And then I'm thinking, man, you know, how do we do this? What do we do? What's, you know, I've worried about lots of stuff. And it's not going away because we worry about it. You know, sometimes we have to make some decisions and get some advice and let others give some instruction and follow it. I remember uh, a pastor years ago, I was listening on a tape. How many of you still have any tapes? Preaching tapes, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I had a preaching tape from a pastor. And the title of the message is What to Do. I'll never forget it. I listened to this back in the 90s. And then I, I, I found that tape in the mid-2000s when we had kids, I was a Bible college student, 
and I had a lot of worry in my life. The title of the message, and it was written, that was back in the days when they actually wrote on the tape. The title of the message was, What to Do When Your Decision Maker is Broken. I thought, what? So I listened to that thing. I've listened to that so many times. And here was the, the what to do. When you don't know how and what decisions to make, go to somebody who walks with God and listen to them. Because sometimes we're in such a fog, we're not hearing God and we're not hearing others and I'm, and I'm only hearing me and everything's all messed up. And if we're self-advised, we're just going to ruin everything. Yeah. Let somebody advise. So I'm going to be honest with you. That's what I did. That's what I did on this project. Yeah. And I've got some experience and I've got some abilities and I've got some, okay, but I just, certain things, I've just walked this thing out a lot of different ways. So I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, I need you to run this thing. He's got the experience, and he's got the wisdom, and he's got the mind. Thank the Lord for my dad. <laughs> he's the mastermind behind all this stuff, saving our church hundreds of thousands of dollars, by the way. And basically, I'm just trying to be a good listener. He's my dad. I'm the son, kind of back to teenage years. I just need to learn how to obey. When he says, take that wall down, okay, we need to go take that wall down. When he says, we need to hire somebody, we need to hire somebody. I'm just trying to follow instructions right now. And there's a bunch of stuff that I'm doing, I get that. But when it comes to kind of the big stuff, and I think that there's some value in that. Amen. When it comes to some big stuff, why don't you get some advice? Just last week alone, young Marine came to me and said, um, I want to talk to you. I, um, I'd like to get a divorce. I was like, well, um, I'd like to make sure that we talk before you make that decision. Okay, okay, okay. No conversations, none of that. A week later, hey, I want to talk to you. Oh, I already signed the paperwork. Oh, I'm getting a divorce. Oh, okay. You know, you can't come to God at the last second having been around the ability to go to church somewhere for a long time and think that this self-led stuff, that you're right all the time. Yeah. It might shock you, but others might have the mind of God. Amen. And we all need it. Amen? Amen? Let me give you this lastly. Anxiety can cause us to not think properly. A nurse received a call from an, an anxious woman who said, in quote, I'm a diabetic and I'm afraid I've, I've had too much sugar today. The nurse replied, are you lightheaded? The woman replied, no, I'm a brunette. <laughs> Thanks for coming to church tonight. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, when we get anxious, when we get um, negative, when we get worried, we, we can make uh, bad choices and we can um, see through that lens that everything in you and others are like that. And I pray that you just clean our minds up tonight. Help our heart to be pure. I pray that we would have faith like Hannah, but also have commitment like Hannah. We'll see further next week more of her life, but I pray, Lord, that uh, the value of the word of God would penetrate into our heart this week, that we make decisions of faith, that we would not be arrogant or uh, uh, prideful, that we wouldn't think that we got this whole word of God thing down. There's so much that we need to learn, and we may not have certain perspectives correctly, would we just continue to study? Would we have a good attitude? Would we get along with others? Would we not be self-led? I pray that you would guide us. And we love you, Lord. We're excited about this week. I pray for your hand. I pray for your heart. I pray for your advice and that you would walk us through, keep everybody safe. We're working with lots of amperage, 
and uh, that there wouldn't be any damage or harm. I pray that you would give wisdom and that we would advance just this week. Make us to go forward. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, love you, church. Brother Nick, why don't you play? Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's been a good day in church.